So welcome uh, everyone. I'm Despina Stratagakis, Vice Provost for Inclusive Excellence. It is my honor to welcome Dr. Cassidy Sugimoto to the University of Buffalo and the Gender Institute. Dr. Sugimoto is professor and Tom and Marie Payton School Chair in the School of Public Policy at Georgia Institute of Technology. Her research examines the formal and informal ways in which knowledge is produced, disseminated, consumed, and supported with an emphasis on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Sugimoto has won many awards for her teaching as well as her service, which has included serving as the program director for the Science and Innovation Policy Program at the National Science Foundation. She has a fascinating educational background with a bachelor's degree in music performance, a master's degree in library science, and a doctoral degree in information and library science, all from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Today, Dr. Sigamoto will be talking about the magnification of inequalities during COVID-19 and why it matters for science. Please put any questions in the chat, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the hour. Dr. Sugimoto, thank you for joining us virtually at UB. Thank you so much, Sina. I am delighted to be here. Um, I had a wonderful chat this morning with several of the faculty, and I think it highlights one of the things that I miss the most about in-person conversations is that bi-directionality. So often these virtual talks are very unidirectional um, and it doesn't allow me to get really critiqued and interrogated as I'd like. So I have to say this morning posed some really difficult questions for me that I have to continue to think about and move forward. And my hope for today's talk is that the same thing will happen, that you will challenge me, question me, um, call me out on things. I, I want this research to be better. I want this research to be activated. I want to um, examine a, a new world in which we can all live together um, and a world that is much more equitable than it currently is right now. So I look forward to the conversation um, and to sharing my research with all of you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the magnification of inequities, but to start doing that, I want to frame it with some of the questions um, that I ask. I look at whether there's equity in who gets to be a scientist. And what I mean by science and scientists throughout this is sort of the Germanic way of this, a vision shaft of knowledge creation. So I am not thinking about this in the natural and medical sciences alone, but really thinking about how people produce knowledge. So who gets to produce knowledge? Who gets to be a credible knowledge producer? Who gets certified as a knowledge producer? Um, and then how is that knowledge produced itself? How is scientific work done? And what are our reward structures for scientific work? work. And in all of that is the equity piece. Is this done equitably? And so some of the slides I'll start with will talk about each of these components to look at whether there is equity within our system. And I often look at gatekeeping spaces, those moments, those milestones in scientific work and scholarly communication, particularly, which is my area of focus, to look at what kinds of inclusion and exclusion mechanisms we have. So I'll start from doctoral education. We'll think about authorship, that is being an author on the byline of a journal article in this case, which is where most of my evidence comes from. Thinking about contributorship, what kind of labor is done to warrant authorship, how it goes through the process of peer review in order to become something that is part of the permanent scientific record. And then how it is utilized by other scientists in the form of impact and citation exchange and how it's funding, which we could arguably put at the top of that cycle. And through all of this, I wanna think about that lens of COVID, how COVID magnifies some of these patterns that we observe in the data. And then I wanna conclude with sort of an, a conversation about epistemic gaps. Um, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we often think about it from the justice perspective. That is, how does it benefit the individual? What is the um, ability of it to meet those sort of universal norms of universalism and socialism that we think about in the Mertonian sense. Um, but I also want to think about how it changes knowledge production itself. What does a diverse workforce um, beget in terms of scientific outcomes? So I'll sort of end with that. I do want to start with a disclaimer on classifications itself. Throughout this talk, I'm going to be using a binary gender description of men and women, and I may accidentally slip up and say male or female using sex terms for gender terms, and I'll, I'll try to watch that and apologize for any slips that I may have in that way. 
Um, we'll also be using US census classifications on race, which are highly problematic and have been problematized over centuries. Um, but I do fall into the standpoint of Dignazio and Klein, as well as Best and Zuberi, who talk about counting and measuring not always having to be tools of, of, of oppression, which in many cases is how they were institutionalized, but also used to hold power accountable, to reclaim overlooked histories, and to build collectivity and solidarity. Um, as Zuberi said, the racialization of data is an artifact of both the struggles to preserve and to destroy racial stratification. So I want to sort of acknowledge the limitations of these classification systems themselves, but also utilize them to make evidence-based policy to break down the disparities that we observe along these socially constructed lines. So let's go through each of these milestones. And I like to think of this in almost the life cycle or the linear thing. Let's say that you walk in to this socialization into scientific research, which often happens at the point of a doctoral education. What kinds of differences can we see in the outcomes from that? So I'm gonna draw data for this part from two different sources. And I won't spend a lot of time on data throughout this talk, but I think this one bears uh, mentioning because it's such an interesting and rich data source. The survey of earned doctorates and the survey of doctoral recipients from the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics at the National Science Foundation is a beautiful survey replete with information on sociodemographic characteristics, historical background, where the person is born, where they're from, where they went to undergrad, whether they are in a uh, marital arrangement, whether they have children, what kind of salary had the sector that they went to, whether they're a first generation college student, all of these things which are really important to understand um, the scientific workforce and their trajectory through this space. So we've used these data which have both the census and then a semi longitudinal survey that's been done since 1973, where we can really see progress over time. And we match that with the web of science, which despite all of its limitations and caveats, which we can definitely talk about, provides us an indicator of their publication productivity and the degree to which they receive citations. Now, we kind of collapse that down into a really simple binary kind of um, distinction on this. And what we wanted to look at was that intersection of race and ethnicity on production and how that plays out um, in terms of their trajectory, in terms of attrition or retention in science. So let's just start by looking at disparities in doctoral education itself and in doctoral graduates. If we look here, we see that men are overrepresented, particularly in the biological and agricultural sciences, engineering, physical, social um, sciences. Women overrepresented in the psychological sciences and fairly highly represented in both biological, agricultural, and social science. White women, particularly. We see Asian men and Asian women highly represented in engineering. Um, and we see Hispanic and Black scholars very, with low levels of representation and levels of representation that don't match, match their proportion in the population. Now we wanted to see what their career trajectory looked like. So we looked at both their first job and six years after the kind of job that they were in. And we wanted to understand whether this was in research and development or not, and whether that research and development was in academic settings or not. And the very single indicator that we looked at was whether they had a publication or not as one indicator of their socialization into the research process. So we looked at whether they had a publication before their PhD and then within six years after and how that translated to their trajectory. And what we saw was having a publication was an incredibly strong predictor of going into an R&D career, both academic and not. And that it was the strongest when that happened before the PhD. So that socialization became a very clear indicator of their pathway into the scientific workforce. But when we looked at the odds of publishing pre-doctorate, we saw sharp differences by both race and ethnicity, with Asian, Black, and Hispanic authors less likely than white authors to have a publication before PhD and women less likely than men to have one as well. Now we see that a lot of that actually falls out in the postdoctorate publishing. You see those error bars are widely overlapping and coming out, which suggests that the moment, that very critical moment actually happens before they get their PhD, whether they become socialized into research or not. So we looked across all of these different variables to see what could predict having a publication, controlling for all else, whether it was an R1 institution, the discipline, whether they were a first generation college student, all of these other variables. And we found a very simple and intuitive indicator, whether they had a research assistantship. And the research assistantship was also not equally distributed. Asian and white scholars were disproportionately likely to have a research assistantship compared to Black, Hispanic, 
and women scholars were less likely than men scholars to have these research assistantships. So this suggests that in admittance, in that very day that we admit a doctoral student, we create a path dependency, whether we give them a research assistantship versus a teaching assistantship, is creating a path dependency towards or against a career within uh, the scientific workforce. Now, what was particularly interesting when we look at DEI um, initiatives is that many times we fund students who are minoritized um, by the form of fellowships. And we also looked into fellowships and fellowships were not a good predictor of being socialized into research in this process of having publication, which suggests that many times those support mechanisms may act against our intentions. When we're looking at retention in the scientific workforce, we have to make sure that that funding comes with integration into scientific work, not mere funding for attending um, the educational institution. So there are very simple policy levers that I think we have at the institutional space in order to increase retention um, and support minoritized populations in science. So let's say you get that research assistantship, you're in a lab, and now you guys are working on a paper. What do we see in terms of authorship? That is your name on the byline of the paper. As Foucault famously asked in his essay, What is an Author? What does it matter who is speaking? Well, in the area of scholarly communication, it matters a lot. Authorship is really the coin of the realm. It's that economy of reputation um, around which all things circulate, for better or for worse, in many cases, the latter. Um, we think about it as credit, right? Credit for idea of discovery, but it's also responsibility when we think about misconduct or fraud, having your name on the paper is in some ways serving as a guarantor of the kind of research that happens under this. Now, when we think about it, it's publications, it's citations, all of those things come from authors. So it's very important. Despite this, authorships are not distributed equally across the world. So if we think of this by gender differences in the proportion of authorships, just looking at Web of Science, we can see those countries that have a higher degree of male authorships in their publication um, are shown in darker blue. And if there were any countries with higher degree of female authorship, we would see those in orange. Um, there are a few countries in the parity zone. And so those have been interesting countries for us to investigate. Where are countries where men and women are producing authorships at roughly the same rates? But unfortunately, these are not necessarily um, exemplary stories. What we see in many of these countries is that they have um, less intensive, resource intensive scientific infrastructure, and in many cases experience brain drain where many of the scientists, particularly the men who have higher levels of mobility, are able to leave that country for other countries. In fact, we did a large regression on this, trying to find what are those biggest predictors of female um, production of science. And when we regressed everything, threw everything in the bucket, the single greatest predictor was male mortality. Now, as a policy scholar, um, that's a bit problematic, right? That's not really a policy lever or implication that we can have, but it speaks to this parity paradox. Sometimes where we see parity, it's where science is not valued, where science has underrepresentation or under-resource within the sort of global economic sector within that country. Um, so this becomes sort of a problematic space. Now you may say, okay, you're looking at web of science data. We know that skews towards certain disciplines. So maybe what we're just seeing there is disciplinary representation. But if we look at the male authorship across disciplines, we see that math and physics still remain heavily male dominated. Um, we do have more women in the biomedical sciences and then in the humanities and social sciences, we return mostly to male dominated professions. Those disciplines where we see large degrees of women tend to be what we are considering care disciplines nursing, education, social work, speech and language sciences, um, and disciplines that in many cases are also themselves under-resourced within the academic landscape. And I apologize for my very vocal puppy who's decided to participate in today's talk. So when we have that, we see, all right, why are we seeing those kinds of things? In the biomedical sciences, women have been out matriculating men for decades. Why do we not see higher representation of women in biology, say? So one of the things we wanted to dig into was disagreements in authorship. Who gets named and where do they get placed? Partic particularly for the natural and medical sciences where dominant author roles like first and last author really matter. Are we seeing certain differences here that may explain some of those large global studies that we see? 
So we did a survey of about 10,000 different authors to ask them whether they had ever experienced an authorship dispute. And about a third of all authors had experienced an authorship dispute, but women were more likely to experience a dispute and to experience more often. So we asked them, what's the biggest contributor to an authorship dispute? Why do you disagree? And both men and women said the same thing overwhelmingly, that what it really was, was a different, a difference in valuing contributions, how they valued contributions came up in the authorship dispute, whether that contribution merited authorship or not. So we asked them, all right, what kinds of tasks do you value? And what was fascinating is that women valued every task more than men on average, except for one, the technical work. And we'll come back to why that matters in a second. But we also asked them, when do you discuss authorship and how do you discuss authorship? And what we found were that there were gender differences in this as well. Women were much more likely to discuss authorship at the beginning of the process and throughout the process with all authors involved. Men were more likely to decide either unilaterally at the end of the project or with a few key stakeholders, usually other senior authors, about the authorship space. Now, I'm not making a normative judgment about which is better, but there are different kinds of effects that come in here sociologically and psychologically, recency effects and primacy effects. What are the contribution tasks that really matter at the beginning of a project, like research design, to what are the kinds of contributions that matter at the end, maybe the editing, the reviewing, the analysis, and the visualization. And so we have different kinds of tasks which are going to take precedent in the mind when you're discussing authorship, and these may lead to gender dimensions. We also saw that the consequences of these disputes were different along gendered lines as well. Men were more likely to report different kinds of aggressive behavior, hostility, misconduct, fraud, sabotage as a result of naming disputes, whereas women were disproportionately likely to represent isolation, removal um, from these different collaborative networks. Now, this kind of removal has huge implications for scientific careers. We also see these kinds of different spaces, and one might think of it as isolation in their collaboration networks. So when we look across how they find out in how they are in the sphere of collaboration, we can look at one simple indicator, which is national versus international collaboration. Now at a country level, smaller countries like Switzerland and the Philippines are much more likely to have higher degrees of international collaboration. Larger countries like the United States and China that have many institutions with them and a high degree of um, scientific workforce are more likely to have national collaboration. But what was fascinating is that invariant of country size, women's work was much more likely to be done in national or domestic collaborations vis-a-vis -vis their male counterparts who are much more likely to be in these international collaborations. Now, this creates certain kinds of constraints, which we'll see later in terms of impact and access to resources in the international space. We also see high degrees of homophily along race and gender lines. So looking within data within the United States, we find that male authors are disproportionately likely to select on other male authors, both in terms of all the authors, which you see on the right, and in those dominant author positions, last and first author, which you see on the left. Women were also disproportionately likely to select other women. The one space where we see that race or ethnicity was a stronger driver than uh, gender was in our Asian authors. Now for the US, one of the explanations that we have for this is our inability to disengage from our race and ethnicity classifications for the immigrant status. And whether these were, part, were students who were foreign born students coming to the United States and participating and returning home, which we have some evidence to suggest that they are. But these homophilies, these intersectional homophilies are really interesting. Now you may say, well, they play out equally, right? Men are selecting on men, women on women. So what's the problem? But given the disproportionate rates in the scientific workforce, this creates disproportionate disadvantages when you're selecting on homophily. So let's say you've gotten through doctoral education, you've got your name on a paper. What kind of work did you do? What was the labor underlying that work that allowed you to be on that paper. So we're going to draw from the sort of work on contributorship. And this was proposed by several editors of biomedical journals more than 20 years ago who said, you know what, authorship doesn't really work. When you have 
papers coming out of higher energy physics that have more than 5,000 authors on them, it really doesn't make sense to talk about an author, someone who's penning the paper. But we need to move to something more like movie credits, where we can roll down and say, what did you do? What did you contribute for this product that we're seeing now, this scientific product? So they argued for this, and many biomedical journals picked it up and started identifying, in addition to the authorship list, what people did. But these data were embedded in PDFs, sort of in the acknowledgement form in really idiosyncratic ways. So it wasn't until the Public Library of Science put this forward in an XML format where you had the authorship, you had these contributorships, that we could really mine them at scale to understand these contributorship types and uh, how they sort of differ along different sociodemographic characteristics. Now, we have two different data sets on contributorship here. I won't go into them in too much detail. But to say at first, PLOS really collected these idiosyncratically. So we had to kind of go through these authorship things with their names, sometimes initials, sometimes full names, and collapse them into a few key categories. And there were five, analyzing the data, conceiving and designing experiments, contributing reagents, materials, performing experiences, and writing the paper. And as you can see, these are heavily skewed towards the biomedical sciences. What's fascinating to me is that other category. There were more than 20,000 different types that we couldn't put into one of those. And they represented about a fifth of all papers had at least one of these contribution types. So I think that's really interesting about the heterogeneity of scientific uh, contribution and that long tail of tasks and labor that often goes unaccounted for in scientific work. But just looking at these five, we looked at several different dimensions. And one of them was the association and isolation of different tasks. And we wanted to see, is the person who's writing the paper the same person who conceived and designed it? Typically, yes. Is the same person who contributed materials? Do they do anything else? Typically, no. And what was fascinating is that the most isolated contribution type was actually performing experimentation, which is fascinating from the perspective of fraud and misconduct. Is the person designing it? The person writing it up is not the same person doing the work. Now, if you're in a science lab, this all makes sense to you. Um, but when we start to really interrogate that theoretically, it brings up really interesting questions about the fragmentation of labor and what that means for scientific integrity. It also has really interesting implications along different sociodemographic lines. We find that older scholars are more likely to conceive and design or contribute tools, whereas younger scholars are more likely to perform experimentation. That makes sense, again, for anyone who's been in a science lab. But when you control for all these things, for age, for collaboration, for discipline, what we find is that women are disproportionately likely to be performing experimentation um, and men more likely to be doing the other tasks. So this is really interesting on many different fronts. When we think back to our survey, that one category that women valued less is the one category with which they are disproportionately associated, which gives a really interesting conversation about self-valuation in science and advocacy for contribution to scientific work. Now, we also took these five categories and we tried to create profiles of scholars to understand what is the profile of a scholar and how does it change over time? Are you a leader? Are you given a first authorship position where you do several of the tasks? Are you really associated with one specialized thing or you are supporting? You mostly give tools and contribute reagents and resources. And what we found is that men were disproportionately likely to be leaders and particularly likely to be in junior and early career stages relative to women. And this continued throughout the life cycle. But if we look at this over time, we find that being a leader early in your career is a large predictor of being a leader later on in your career. And we see large degrees of attrition from those in specialized and supporting roles where women are much more likely to be associated than being in the leadership role. So this goes back to some of the work that we saw for doctoral education. Those early socialization things have huge implications for your career trajectory. Being placed on a research team and being given an opportunity for a leadership role are going to be large predictors of your ability to stay in science. Now, the credit taxonomy has come out a few years ago and has been adopted by hundreds of journals now, which takes that idea of contributorship and standardizes it. Now, there are many critiques of this uh, taxonomy in that it really reifies certain kinds of tasks, largely in the biomedical and natural sciences, but it does give us a little bit more nuance. Instead of just writing the draft, we have writing the original draft and doing the reviewing and editing. Instead of just performing experiments, 
we have a large degree of things, methodology, analysis, data curation, visualization, validation, that we can start to see some of these categories. And we continue to see gender dimensions here, where male authorship is more likely to be associated with many of those senior roles, supervision, funding, resources, conceptualization, software, reviewing and editing, administration, validation. Whereas women are doing methodology, visualization, formal analysis, writing the whole paper, data curation, and investigation. Now, if you think back to that blue graph, we say, oh, science is mostly done by men. But when I look at these data on the labor, science is really done by women. And so it becomes a very interesting conversation to really dig into the lab to understand the labor contributions and how they're being made manifest on different publications. So let's say we've gotten through that. Now you have that manuscript and you're ready to send it out. What is going to happen? What is the process and what is the evaluative uh, system going to yield, particularly if you are a woman? So we take eLife as a case study and eLife is a really fascinating journal. So it was started by a Nobel laureate who took his Nobel money and said, scholarly communication is broken. It's inherently broken and I wanna fix it. And I have some ideas on how to fix it. So I'm gonna start an open access journal, eLife, um, and I'm gonna change how we do things. And one of those things was to introduce the notion of consultative peer review for a journal. Now this is not unlike many different kind of meta review panels that you have at conferences. But what's interesting about this is it takes a piece and it says, all right, I'm going to, instead of sending it out to reviewer A, reviewer B, reviewer C, um, I'm actually going to bring all those reviewers into a room and they're going to discuss this together, the pros and the cons, and they're going to build a consensus report that they all agree to. And we're going to send one report to the author so that they're not trying to deal with conflicting advice from different reviewers, but they're getting one set. And the idea of this is that it should reduce disparities, that you don't get ad hominem attacks that you can actually check people on their different biases that they're coming into because you have more people in the room. So Eli wanted to see uh, whether this was actually creating some, um, some outcomes that benefit in terms of equity. And so two things to mention here, Eli goes through a very formalized gatekeeping or desk rejection process, whether they either encourage you to submit a full proposal or you reject or rejected. And about 75% of things are rejected at that gatekeeping function. So it's a very important point before they actually go to consultative peer review. And then about a 50% of things that go to consultative peer review are accepted. Now, if we look at this along gendered lines, we can look at different kinds of things. First is the input and then is the process. Now, if we just look at submissions, we see there's about 25% coming from women, which is less than we would expect given the um, distribution of authorships in this area of research. We would expect closer to 32, 35%. So they do have a problem there in terms of who is submitting to their journal and something they need to look at in terms of why they may be getting lower degrees of submissions than we expected. But once they go through, we find that men are accepted at a significantly different rate um, and men are encouraged at a significantly different rate. Now you may look at those differences and say, oh, there's only you know, 28 to 30 or 13 to 15%, um, but those are actually fairly large magnitudes and compounded over a career have huge effects. As you know, the biggest predictor of getting accepted to a publication is having been accepted there before. So one of the things we wanted to look at was who were those peers? right? When we talk about peer review, there's an assumption that those who are submitting look like those who are reviewing, but we find that that's not necessarily true. The gatekeepers were much more likely to be male than either the corresponding first or last authors. Gatekeepers were also much more likely to be from North America than corresponding first or last authors as well. And this has implications for the peer review outcomes. What we found is if there was a male last authored paper, which we're kind of clarifying as a, a male paper, um, we found that it had a much higher, a significantly higher chance of being accepted when it was reviewed by all male reviewers. And we saw the exact mirror image when we look at female papers for all female reviewers. And what's fascinating about that is that we see that homophily bias playing out in the same way. Now it's not significant for all female reviewers because there's only 21 papers with a woman as last author reviewed by all women. But when we get to mixed gender reviews, we see no significant difference in outcome, which may suggest that diversity in the peer review team is a mitigating effect on some of these biases. Now we see the homophily effect um, as well by country. If you are a Chinese author and have at least one reviewer from China, you're significantly more likely to be accepted than not. The same is true for Germany, 
or uh, Japan, but insignificantly, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, the United States. The one country that works against this is in France. If you are French, you do not want to be reviewed by one of your countrymen. Uh, terrible outcomes. And we see similar things in Canada, uh, which maybe we can attribute to the Quebecois. So there are certainly cultural differences in the critical nature of review. But overwhelmingly, we see that homophily, both on gender and country lines, has a huge effect. Now you may say, okay, well then, if everyone is acting in these homophilic effects, then we're going to see the same things. But the probability of encountering homophily is going to be much larger for a man from the United States than in other categories. For example, about 91% of reviewing teams has someone from the United States. You go down to about a third for the UK and then a diminishing rate for every country afterwards. So you don't have an equal opportunity for that homophily. So if we look to the factors that lead to acceptance at the end, just getting through the gatekeeping, biggest predictors, be from a top institution, be male, um, and acceptance, be from a top institution, be male, and have all male reviewers, which suggests some inequities at play in the peer review process. All right, let's say you did get through. So now you have a paper, you're on the paper, and we're going to see how that paper is utilized by the scientific community. And it's really important to me that we think about this as utilization, not as quality indicator, but how your work is taken up and incorporated into the literature um, in the form of citations. And what we see here is that the lowest citations are associated with those with a female single author. Single authored work is less cited than national um, collaborations and national collaborations are less cited than international collaborations. But in each and every stage, we find that a woman in first and last authorship roles are cited at a lesser degree than men in first and last author roles. Now, if you remember back to those different collaboration behaviors, we see a compound disadvantage. Women are less likely to have international collaborations and international collaborations receive higher citations on average. We also see these compound disadvantages when we look at race. So using US census data and data just within the United States, we see what I find to be sort of a horrifying cliff here. Again, women within each racial category are cited at a le lesser degree than their male counterparts. But when a name, the likelihood that a surname becomes associated with race, when it's visibly associated with race, 90 or to 100% probability for Hispanic or black scholars, we find that the citation rate for men drops precipitously. That is once a name is very uniquely black or uniquely Hispanic, men suffer the same kinds of disadvantage that we see for women in each of these classifications. So then particularly when we're looking at scholars of color um, and female scholars of color, we see all of these kinds of disadvantages playing out. Now you may say, well, maybe women are just not putting their work in the right places. If they were just, you know, publishing in Science and Nature and PAS, they would receive higher citations. So what we looked at is the journal impact factor of the journals in which they were publishing. And I can say a many, many bad things about the journal impact factor, so we can talk about that later. Um, but what we find is that women are actually publishing in journals with higher impact factor in earth and space sciences and biology and engineering and social sciences. And yet their work is cited at a lesser degree relative to their male counterparts. Now you can say, well, citations are highly skewed, so are impact factors. So Let's look at the deciles here. So we take the impact factor down to the decile and we look at the difference between the citations from men and women papers within each of those. We see very little difference at the lowest decile of impact factor, but it's as you move up and up and up that you see the larger difference come out. It's precisely in cell and nature and science and PNAS that we see these large gaps. Now I would argue this is one of the best evidences that it's not a quality difference at all to get through the selection process for journals that have 5% acceptance rate, rates, you've already established quality. This is now really coming to impact and receipt. We also, again, with that homophily, see intersectional homophily and citations. People have already discovered that men are much more likely to cite themselves, and that does play in, but doesn't explain everything. But we see that at the intersection of race and gender, men more likely to cite other men, women, other women, and the same thing on that diagonal on the, that intersection of race and gender. So again, we see this playing out. Given that there are more white men in the system, those disproportionate homophilic uh, effects of citing one's own population is going to have advantages for white men that does not carry through equally for the other populations. 
So we'll go to the final stage here, which is funding. So how do you get resourced? And many times people go into scientific work and particularly for the natural and biomedical sciences, funding is increasingly seen as an input indicator rather than output indicator, meaning you have to have had funding, received funding in order to get tenure. Um, I would argue against this, but let's look at this indicator and see how it might create some of these disparities within the scientific workforce. So using academic analytics, which again is a data source that we can critique and certainly has some flaws, but gives us a sense across different disciplines within the United States about several funding agencies. We can look at just the proportion of men and women who hold a grant. And what we find is in medical sciences, men are more likely to hold a grant, but in engineering, women are actually more likely to hold a grant. But when we look at the value of those, we find that even if the averages or means are only slightly different, men are much more likely to have the large grants, those big center grants, those large institute kinds of grants that are drawing it. And that's true across the different spaces. Now you may say, well, that's because men are older, right? They are senior authors. We know that they make up about 75% of full professors and they're more likely to have those grants. But when we look at the probability of holding a grant by age, we find sort of a selection effect here for those who received a PhD before 1975 on the left-hand side here, there's pretty equal rates of men and women receiving grants. It's actually in the younger and younger and younger cohorts that the discrepancy arises, that men become more and more likely to hold a grant than their female counterpart. Now, this again leads to that selection effect. If you don't get a grant and you don't get tenure, you leave the system, leaving only those women behind who were able to get it, even though they are getting it at disproportionate rates. Now, this differs by different disciplines. In the natural sciences, we actually find that men and women are getting grants at about the same rates, um, even in the junior cohorts. But it's in the medical sciences that we see this really dramatic gap. And that is one of the places where it really matters, both as an input variable, and as we'll see with consequences for epistemic shifts. So we've talked about all of these different things that are happening within academe, within higher education, within scholarly communication. Um, and at each of these points, we see how they create barriers and exclusions for women and scholars of color. But of course, that's not the only place that is providing certain kinds of constraints or burdens. So I want to take a moment just to look at parenting itself and how that might play out in, the, um, in some of these production and citation indicators that we've seen before. So we did a, a survey of, of more than 10,000 um, scholars, those who had published a paper within Web of Science, and we asked them to self-identify their parenting roles. Now, the majority of both men and women said that they, were lead, uh, that they were dual parents, that parenting was shared equally between them. Women were slightly more likely to identify as lead parents and men as satellite parents, where someone else was serving as the primary caregiver. So I was actually a little bit surprised at this large degree of shared parenting, where both men and women academics were saying, we share parenting equally. So we asked them, all right, at what times of day are you lead parent? And women were more likely to be lead parent at every time of the day, weekdays and weeknights. I said, okay, but they were more likely to be lead parents, so maybe that plays in. And then we looked at it and said, no, the men who identified as lead parent, they participated fairly equally, but those men who identified as shared parents did not seem to be playing an equal role. And women who identified as satellite parents were actually lead parenting as many times per day as shared parents were. So there's something going on here. So we took dozens of tasks and we said, what tasks are you doing? And we found that in each category, lead, dual, and satellite, women were more likely to do almost every single task and serve as lead parent in, in that task, save one. Men were coaching sporting teams. So that's one contribution, but I hardly think a contribution that warrants uh, dual parenting. So what we found here was in their self-reporting, um, women were in some ways undervaluing their contributions, selecting dual or shared parenting when they were doing disproportionate labor or selecting satellite parenting when they were actually doing dual or lead labor. And men were overrepresenting their contributions, identifying themselves, identifying themselves as shared parents when they were really serving in more of a satellite role. Now, what was amazing is we were able to identify parents who were in a dual academic household, where both the men and women and all of our respondents, save about a dozen, were in heterosexual partnerships. Um, 
identified that they had someone in that same sector. So this is a beautiful sort of quasi-experimental design. You have the same labor expectations. You're both within academe. Um, who takes on the majority of childcare so that the other one can focus on their career? And we asked this question in sort of two inverted ways and they completely mapped on. Women said that they took on the majority of childcare so their partner could focus and men agreed with this statement. Even in these dual academic households where we should assume equal levels of uh, labor, both professionally and personally. And this has implications for production. Those, both men and women who were in lead parenting roles were less productive on average than, on, than the global average and less productive than their peers who were in dual or satellite parenting roles. But in each and every one of these things, we see that women take a greater hit for parenting than men. Now this may come to some of that self-identification with women, women underrepresenting and men overrepresenting their labor distributions. But it's something that we have to keep in mind as we're doing some of these studies. And when we think about sort of equal parental release, equal parental support, um, that we may still see some of these disproportionate um, evidences of disparities. Now, we also saw a parenting penalty in citation. And again, think about this citations as utility and visibility, largely drawn by visibility. So what led to higher citations? Well, being, being a male, taking shorter parental leave, having your partner coordinate play dates, don't celebrate any holidays, don't be religious, and travel. Be away from the house as much as possible. What lowered your citation? Well, having more than two kids, taking a long parental leave, being primary or equal, helping your kids with extracurricular, and then basically any indicator that was associated with having young children um, led to a decrease in citation. Now, I wanna just be really clear that this doesn't mean I'm not doing as high quality work. It means that my work is not visible. I'm not able to be mobile. I'm not able to attend conferences. The more time that I spend in caregiving, the less able I am to be visible in the scientific work, given our current infrastructure around higher education and scholarly communication. So this is the perfect storm for the pandemic to hit. So you have all of these disparities that are going on in scholarly communication and higher ed. You have these disproportionate caregiving responsibilities. We talked about child care there, but certainly elder care comes in as well, as well as community care, which disproportionately affects certain populations. And then bam, you have a pandemic. So as someone who studies scholarly communication, there were very interesting things that happened during the pandemic. One of them was this welcome trust statement. Um, which they brought together dozens of the leading publishers, funders, institutions, all to agree to certain open scholarly communication practices, which I'm very much in favor of. So they said, we're gonna make sure that all peer reviewed research publications are made immediately open access. We're gonna encourage people to share preprints and we want them to not come at the expense of their publications. So this was an amazing shift in which they said, we need to start doing this. And people did, there was this spike in preprints, particularly in bioarchive and med archive where much of the COVID related research was visible. Even in those places that are not focused on COVID like the National Bureau of Economic Research, we see a huge spike and that's driven largely by things studying COVID-related um, ideas and evidence. Now, not all were able to pivot as quickly um, on this COVID train. And what we saw was actually a dramatic decline in med archive at the onset of the pandemic. And that was held particularly by first authored females. So women who were in last author positions, senior women who were maybe less likely to have children um, under the age of 12 or with certain uh, degrees of childbearing activities, we're less likely to see this decline than our junior and early career researchers um, who dramatically decreased and were also much less likely uh, to pivot and shift to COVID-related research. And as I mentioned in the talk this morning, I was at the National Science Foundation during this where Congress authorized a huge amount of money to COVID-related research. And I sat there in dismay watching the kinds of proposals that were able to come in, the kinds of individuals who were able to pivot, the kinds of institutions that were able to support that pivot, um, and definitely saw the kind of amplification of all of these disparities that we've understood before. So what are the consequences to this? A lot of times when I do talks, people say, all right, but aren't children important? Isn't it good that Women are at home taking care of them. Don't children need to be raised well? Um, and I'm the mother of two children. And I, you know, 
I love spending time with my kids. It's a really important thing. But what are the consequences to the scientific work for each of the moments um, that we're, we're sort of trading and playing in this balance? What happens in science? So we did a really interesting study where we looked, and this should actually say sex as an object of study, where we looked at the sex of the populations that were utilized in biomedical research. So we looked at it for biomedical, for clinical, and for public health. Now in biomedical research, you see that 70 to 80% of the publications neither report or do any kinds of sex reporting. They do not analyze on the basis of sex. Um, and so they don't report whether they're using both sexes, female or male only. Now you may say, well, that's at the cellular level. So does it matter? But it does. The sex of the cell has huge implications for the absorption of lipids for the responsors to stress. And when we look at the drugs withdrawn from the market, a majority of drugs are withdrawn because they have adverse effects for women. They weren't tested taking women into account or taking sex into account at all as an analytic variable. Now we see a huge rise in clinical medicine and public health in the inclusion of both sexes. This is largely due to the National Institutes of Health and other agencies which have mandated sex reporting and have mandated that both sexes be included unless it's warranted in terms of the research design. Now, if we look at this by discipline, some of it makes sense, you know, in terms of face validity. Women are more likely to be studied in obstetrics and gynecology and men more likely in neurology. But there's no real reason why we should be studying men at a higher degree in physiology or pharmacy um, or addicted diseases. And so there's many spaces here where we see these disproportionate effects. Now, what we did is we overlaid that with the authors. And we found that women were much more likely to take sex into account as an analytical variable and much more likely to study women as well. And this was heightened when you had a woman in both first and last or author roles. So simply speaking, women in the biomedical research workforce changes what we know about women and about women's health. And given that women make up 50% of the population and 100% of the birthing population, this seems like a really important thing to take into consideration. And we've also begun looking at race for people within the scholars within the United States um, and trying to understand this homophily in topic selection as well. Do people, are people much more likely to select things that resonate with their lived experiences? And we find that indeed they do, both in social sciences and in health. If we look at the racialization of a certain um, topic area, as well as the feminization, we find that, for example, uh, women of color are more likely to study gender-based violence. We find that uh, Asian scholars are more likely to look at China as an object of study, that our Latinx scholars look at the Latinx body, they look at discrimination, they look at the English-Spanish space, they look at literacy rates. So we see all of these different places where the composition of the scientific workforce fundamentally changes the kind of knowledge that we produce. So this looks at equity, not just from a justice perspective, which is incredibly important, but also looks at it from sort of a utilitarian perspective. How does this change science and create a more robust scientific system covering the range of experiences of the population? So we did just sort of a back of the envelope calculation looking at the US census. And if we made it completely representative by race and gender with the US census in terms of the scientific workforce, we have about 30 more, 30 percent more articles on public health, 20 percent more on gender-based violence, 18 percent more on tropical diseases, and 17 percent more research on families. And given the current environment that we live in, all of these topics seem very relevant, timely, and important to investigate. So my last slide before we go into questions, um, I just want to sort of bring up this crash test dummy. And you've probably all heard this anecdote, but to me, it's just such a powerful one and a good metaphor for thinking about higher ed. Um, so crash test dummies. Women are 47% more likely to have a sustained injury from a car crash and 17% more likely uh, to have a fatality. And when people looked into why this was, they found that women were not introduced as crash test dummies until 2003. And when they were introduced, they were introduced as five foot tall and 110 pounds. And they were placed only in the passenger seat. So if you are over five foot tall and 110 pounds, which I would argue the majority of women are, um, and you are driving, you're non-compliant. If you're pregnant, you're non-compliant. If you're doing anything outside of those parameters, you're non-compliant. And I think we do the exact same thing in higher education. We create an ideal worker. That ideal worker is mobile. 
They have someone dealing with domestic care for them so that they are not doing it. They are able to dedicate up to 80 hours a week in terms of their kind of atmosphere. They are able to come into the office regularly. They have none of these other attachments or different kinds of conditions that make it difficult to perform the research um, education and service obligations that we have for each of our milestones and for our reward system. And so I think we need to actually dramatically rethink higher ed. What is an ideal worker? How are we reinforcing, consistently reinforcing this notion of an ideal worker? And how do we break that apart to actually represent the population that we want to see in science? Not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it creates better science. So with that, I have a few different ideas, but looking at the time, I wanna make sure we have conversations. So I'll just sort of leave these up there. Um, ways in which we can rethink our institutions, our promotion and tenure committees, how we as senior researchers can act in order to create this more equitable future that I'd like to see. Um, so thank you. And I'd like to thank my collaborator, Dr. Uh, Dr. Vincent Larivier, uh, with whom I did all of this research. So I look forward to our conversations. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Cassidy. I, I was glad I had my, my mic muted because <laughs> There was a lot of discussion going on here in the office with myself, um, and uh, I, I just um, I, ca I kept having the the feeling. And thank you so much for this work. Thank you so much for the research and the data. But the the data just uh, sort of clarified, I think, experiences probably that many of us have had that have felt subjective and confounding and so it was in, um, just uh, just wonderful uh, to see although also infuriating um, and that's why the mic had to be off but thank you so much it is just so incredibly important to be able to see it in that way and with that kind of clarity and to understand the significance and um, so I'm sure we have um, a, a lot of questions um, I'm going to start off actually just with the clarification we've got one request to put the second to last slide back up with suggestions, yes, uh, we, you know, that would be great, thank you. And then I had a question regarding um, the, when you were uh, early in your presentation, you were talking about the relationship between higher female authorship uh, in relation to male mortality. And I wasn't, could you just explain that a little further? Yeah. So this is one of the things where we looked at country level indicators. So we take a lot of data from World Bank and from OECD, and we were trying to understand, are there political systems that lead to greater parity? Are there um, economic systems that lead to greater parity? So we were really trying to identify like the key policy lever that, you know, if the United States did this, we would see greater parity. And the one predictor drop that came out was male mortality. So frankly, women were in the scientific workforce because the men um, their average age was about 10 to 12 years less than women. This is largely in war-torn countries, so places where men have either died because of different kinds of conflict or men have left the country for greater opportunities because the country is so resource poor. And so those were the kinds of spaces where we were seeing parity, where women were really the only ones left to do science. Um, so that's a sobering um, finding. Truly. Okay. Thank you um, very much for that clarification. And um, so let me dig into uh, some of the questions. Um, and you've, you've given us um, some fantastic uh, suggestions here with this slide, but I was wondering if you could also um, expand maybe particularly regarding best practices for promotion and uh, tenure um, that institutions could uh, adopt. And um, a follow-up question was, are there any best practices related to journal authorship that you recommend? And I would frame those questions um, if, um, and I'm realizing this is now becoming multi-dimensional, the questions, but from the point of view of the individual um, in terms of what can an individual do yeah. given this, um, 
given this landscape and that the landscape is likely not to change uh, immediately, um, and then best practices from the point of view of the institution as well. So if that's too complex, I can go back and break it down, sorry. Yeah, you, you may have to for me, and I could probably talk for five hours um, on all of these things. In some ways, I think it goes back to what you said earlier, Jasmina, about how the data here makes manifest some of those anecdotes. And every time I talk to people, they say, I've tried to tell this to my um, chair or to my provost or to my p and committee, but they say, oh, it's just you, right? It, it's, it's the kind of work you do doesn't get cited. And maybe you should pivot your work a little, or you should place it differently, or you should apply to a different agency. And so the explanations that people are often hearing coming from key decision makers in their institution reinforces that their experience is particularistic, not universal. And so one thing that is sort of my personal goal is that we can take some of this large scale data to administrators, to p and committees and socialize it. I think we've gotten better about doing more um, training for p and committees. And I have mixed feelings on sort of how implicit bias training works or doesn't work, but we're starting to have those conversations. We also need to incorporate this kind of data in those conversations that if you're using production as your metric to decide whether someone should be tenured or not, you have to understand that that is not equally distributed across populations, that citations are not equally distributed across populations. And you have to take that into account when you're doing your analyses. So I think that there's sort of a, a training and education based on this evidence that we can use to start really advocating that institutions formally remake their criteria with an acknowledgement of this, that when they're sending out letters to external reviewers, that they are again going again and again, reinforcing that we know that these kinds of metrics disadvantage certain populations. So I think that's one thing that we need to kind of collectively as scholars advocate for our institutions to formally adopt this, not just to acknowledge it in, you know, in these informal ways, but to change PNT documents so that they are that this kind of information is embedded in them. I think that's really important. Um, I also love that you talked about the individuals because too often it's easy to blame the administration on all of this, but science is a self-organizing system. Those reviewers that we studied, that's us. We're the reviewers, we're the PIs, we're, the, we're running our labs, right? And we are constantly reinforcing and replicating this. So I think that there are ways that labs can actually hold themselves in check. Um, I've seen some fantastic authorship guidelines that have come out of some labs. Uh, Laramore and Closet at the University of Colorado have a really great one where they say, this is what constitutes authorship in my lab. This is when we'll discuss it and how we'll discuss authorship. And they give that out to their um, you know, new students coming in. And what I love about that is that gives those students a document that they can say, let's start a conversation about this. Like what I just observed doesn't meet what you said you were going to do because students are in a really vulnerable position to advocate for themselves. And so making these kinds of documents available, having those conversations in your lab starting, hey, did we talk about authorship? Let's talk about it. Um, bringing those things in seem really trivial, but I think that they empower the uh, particularly marginalized voices within the lab to start the conversation. So I think there's many things there. I also you know, we could go into funders and journals and what they could do, but I'll let you ask another question. Yeah, thank you. That was terrific. Um, so we have a question about reconceptualizing the ideal worker away from the idea of, you know, working uh, yourself day and night to the bone. Um, and uh, in particular, so we are able to um, uh, for all of us, I think, to live uh, more balanced lifestyles, but also to uh, attract um, more diverse populations into science and, and other professions. So the question is, how could you sell that type of lifestyle um, to, uh, to the institution, uh, to, to the profession? I mean, how do you, how do you given the, the again, the landscape that we find ourselves in, um, make that pitch for uh, a, a different kind of worker and a different way of working. Yeah, that's, it, it's a really difficult one. And I certainly don't have all the answers, but what's fascinating to me is that, and these are definitely not bastions for DEI, but big tech have managed to do some of this, right? They have 
food that they provide, they provide dry cleaning assistance, they provide drivers, they provide childcare, right? They are doing a lot of this work to, to make sure that their, their workers have the sort of care support that they need in order to be productive. They're also allowing work from home in various different ways and facilitating that. And what we see through a lot of the organizational um, theory literature is that these kinds of initiatives actually lead to greater productivity. They do not decrease productivity in any way. So in some ways, I think we can look to that. We, in the United States, I think we have a particular problem. Like we're talking about academe, but if you go to the United Kingdom and you try to go to your office after 6 p.m., you can't because the doors are locked and you don't have a key to the building. And so you are sort of forced to go engage in a work-life balance. Now, of course, you can go home and work on your laptop, but there are ways in which the institution is set up to not demand 24 hour service from academics. And in the US, we have this cult of busyness. Everything is open all of the time. And we see that as a positive thing, but it also incentivizes that we should be working all the time. There's amazing studies of download data looking across countries. And when we look at, for example, France, you see like a two hour dip during lunchtime where no one is downloading any academic articles. If you look um, in the UK, you see very nine to five kinds of things. If you look in the US, there is no deviation. 24 hours a day, people are downloading. Now, of course we have multiple time zones, but still there is nothing to say that that should look like that. So I think there are institutional things we can do to get away from that as being the ideal worker. Thank you so much. We're, we're at our time. Um, it, I so I'm gonna I'm gonna end the questions. Although there are are more, if you have a question that we weren't able to respond to, um, please feel free to send it to me, and I will pass it along. So uh, thank you so much uh, for this incredible hour, um, Dr. Su uh, Sugimoto. I uh, you've given us so much to think about, and um, again, thank you for the research that you are doing and the clarity that you are bringing to these questions and to the um, consequences and significance of this work for, um, for everyone. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. It's been such a delight to be with you today.